Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. What you're looking at here is one of the plates that I have yet to examine, uh, that of the thrice run uh, Amaza vibrator plates. And on the surface, you can see the cavitation pits or corrosion pits. Um, and you can see there's some uh, big ones down the front here, and there's some smaller ones, and then there's none in this zone over here. When I immediately looked at this, um, I thought, well, uh, it would appear that um, there maybe is not much motion here that's uh, in tune with the process that needs to produce these pits, and over here they're uh, more in tune. So that's what I intuited, and uh, I was suggesting that this system is very fault tolerant um, uh, in terms of you can be quite flexible with getting it wrong in terms of the vibration uh, frequency and, and the plates and stuff because you have a wide parameter space across here and across the, the width. This area here between this sort of uh, uh, marked area and the marked area over here um, is where you have uh, the nylon uh, sheet and it's under uh, this area here where we've seen our best uh, strange radiation tracks and I am saying that um, they're kind of born out here and some of them happen to get under here or uh, aggregate and get under here and then they're unable to travel through the uh, PTFE and they get stuck between the PTFE and the metal plate and they move around and uh, pr produce those tracks. Now I just happened to be getting ready to have a look at the once run palladium coated uh, stainless steel sheets and uh, I was quite surprised um, and uh, happy to see that the, uh, the spots on them had corroded and it gives us a nice reference for where they are active. So here we can see there's, there's almost essentially none in this area. And then around this area there are uh, the pits and then on the outside there's not so many pits. So it would seem with whatever vibration that was going up and down and side to side um, with this particular plate this was the sweet spot for this plate and since the magnesium chloride looking at the Parkamov tables and, and including neutrino processes electron uh, inverse electron processes um, point to the most favorable reactions uh, with magnesium and uh, chlor chlorine um, to produce uh, iron and we observed iron and there was also a, a sign of that there was a silver in there that potentially is coming from the deuterium interacting with the palladium on here. But the, the iron's the interesting thing, and, and this is rust. Now, of course, if you have some corrosion um, because of the um, magnesium chloride in the water, and for some reason that's causing corrosion, it is possible to get some rust. But by putting these um, plates into plastic bags shortly after they were run, there was uh, obviously a little bit of moisture on here, so we've got some rust, which is not necessarily iron oxide, and you can go and look that up on rust as a, a compound. Um, but uh, what will be interesting is actually when we come and do some um, sims on this, is to find out if the Parkamov table predicted uh, isotopes of iron that are most favorable to be formed first, energetically speaking, uh, distort the uh, iron ratio that we observe uh, from these pits in terms of the isotopic ratio. So uh, this is great because this gives us something we can look at and determine whether um, uh, Alexander Parkamov's understanding of neutrino processes is actually correct and uh, this could be very, very repeatable. Uh, also, it would uh, demonstrate that the, there's a good chance there was actually transmutation going on if there was a non-natural ratio at these points. So uh, look around these plates. This, each one I'm, I've got here, I've got the top. Now, interestingly, there seems to be nothing going on in this one, and there's some small pits right by the, the fold uh, and the area that's covered with the uh, Teflon. Uh, so this is top one. Now, top one did not spend much time in the water uh, relative to the other ones, and I, there will be a diagram shared about that. Uh, this is top two. And in this case, it has a reasonably similar pattern to uh, top four. Uh, so uh, top two, um, you've got a, a, a none in this zone here, none on the edge, but a, a, a region in the middle. And this seems to be a little bit more spread than on top four. 
and uh, uh, over here uh, we've got some kind of a kind of a, like I say a similar ish pattern to this now top three again nothing in this zone nothing on the edges here and the fat ones uh, going around this edge with uh, some smaller ones petering out uh, here now what I what I will do is I will take high uh, quality photography of these and people uh, if they're interested they might be able to map out what's going on um, with each one uh, and then on top five uh, we can see there's a little bit along the edge here a bit like top one and this band that goes around here uh, again nothing nothing much in the middle nothing and there's a little bit on the tip here now I'm going to flip them over um, because we do have a different pattern on the other side and so that is the full set here, so I'm going to flip them over. They're in the protective uh, plastic sleeves uh, as we received them. Uh, they haven't been taken out of there yet because I've been looking at the thrice run plates. Um, so, on the bottom of plate one, it's a similar kind of pattern, the, the hard and fast uh, big spots somewhere between the middle and the outside now th this back end actually on each plate does vibrate as well but in each case th there's very little action going on there. there's a little splodge in the middle here there's a little bit over here uh, a little bit on there and a little bit here but the majority of the action is actually further away from the the hold line the, the bit that's held between the two PTFP pieces uh, and uh, uh, it's actually further away than the the width of the back part of the fin here. So yeah, so we got a uh, central area here, uh, a couple of, of random spots. Uh, but this, again, this is a fairly dead zone, a fairly dead zone here. This ring here is quite defined and, and a dead zone over here. Uh, fairly dead area here. This is uh, number four bottom. Almost nothing over here and here, and just this little bit here. And uh, and the very, very bottom of the bottom, almost nothing, just a little bit over here. And that's interesting to note. And it, and it could be that uh, pressure between fins themselves. So uh, if we imagine this is fin two and that uh, is the bottom. So the bottom is pointing down to the top of this fin. You, you can see uh, there may be some pressure waves between these two. Uh, going boom, 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 uh, and you're getting a, a pattern over here and here. So um, uh, there's a lot, of, lot to study there, uh, and this may actually uh, help understand whether there was transmutation going on. Now, this whole parameter space sweeping, I will talk about uh, how Piantelli approached this in something that he never disclosed uh, in his patents, but I think it fed through for, for Cardi. Uh, to Defcali and Green Technologies and, and made them make a choice. Uh, Chalani did the same kind of thing, uh, parameter space sweeping, which he had to adjust for by making the knots in uh, his more recent experiments. Uh, and those kind of things were not done in the replication, as I understand it, by University of Missouri when they did Chalani replication and when they did our replication of GS 5.2. And so I don't believe they had success because they didn't have the parameter sweeping in their system. But this has parameter sweeping by default and, in my opinion, makes it very fault tolerant for creating uh, the uh, one potential active agents. Thank you for your time.